From the Presidential Palace in Cairo, Egypt, April 19, 1969. National Educational Television and the New York Times presents News in Perspective. Special Edition, President Gamal Abdel Nasser, in a conversation with Clifton Daniel. It was nearly 25 years ago that I first came to Egypt as a correspondent of the New York Times. Gamal Abdel Nasser was then an obscure young army officer. Now, still only 52 years old, he is president of the country, the United Arab Republic, and has been president for 15 eventful years. We are his guests tonight in the presidential palace. Since I left Cairo in 1947, 22 years ago, much has changed in this part of the world. And many things have changed for the better. But one thing has not changed. The bitter antagonism between the ancient Arab states and the newcomer in their midst, the state of Israel. Three times the Arabs and Israelis have gone to war. In 1948, in 1956, and 1967. Now, <coughs> efforts are being made by the United Nations and jointly by the United States, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union to make peace between the Arabs and the Israelis to make peace before they take up arms again. Must there be a fourth round in the war? Can the peace efforts succeed? To answer these and other questions, we turn to the most important and most influential man in the Arab world, President Nasser himself, appearing on foreign television for the first time since the 1967 war. President Nasser, King Hussein of Jordan, said in a speech in Washington recently that he was speaking with your personal authority when he offered Israel a six-point settlement of the 1967 war. Do you wish to add to or elaborate upon the King's statement? Well, it was said by the news agencies and the press that in the press club in uh, New York, King Hussein said uh, these uh, points. But I said that this was a new project for a peaceful uh, settlement between the Arabs and the Israelis. Well, I, I don't think that there is a new project for a settlement. There is only one project. This is uh, the United Nations uh, Security Council uh, resolution of 1967. Of course, uh, King Hussein and I have agreed about the uh, implementation of this uh, resolution. So there is nothing new, there is no new plan. Well, I think I agree with you that King Hussein's points were precisely the same ones that you gave to Newsweek in February in a conversation like this one. Uh, and they are based, I believe, uh, on the, clearly on the resolution of the United Nations. King Hussein was more specific, it seems, on only one point. And that is a point, I think, that attracted the greatest interest in the United States. He said, or implied, that Israel would get freedom of navigation through the Suez Canal uh, in any settlement of the war. Is that, in your view, a correct interpretation of the 1967 resolution and of your own six points? Well, of course, according to the United Nations uh, resolution, there are two main uh, points. The first point was about the uh, complete withdrawal 
of the Israeli armed forces from the occupied Arab territories. The second main point was the non-belligerency by all nations in the area, then the right of each country to live in peace, then uh, the integrity of the countries in the Middle East. This was the main first point. The second main point was about the freedom of navigation on the water passages, then uh, solving the refugee problem according to the United Nations and must be just solution. And the uh, uh, third uh, point was about demilitarized zones and something like that. So there was nothing in the uh, resolution uh, specifically about the Suez Canal, but it is a package deal. You know, if Israel agrees about the implementation of all the points of the resolution, well, so they, they will have free passage in the Suez Canal. If they don't agree about the implementation of all the resolution, then there will be no peaceful settlement. The problem will continue. Let me be sure I am understanding your point now. The, the United Nations resolution referred to, I think, uh, freedom of navigation on international waterways. Uh, do you consider that the Suez Canal is an international waterway and should be free to all nations, assuming, as you say, that a peaceful settlement was reached with yes. Israel? Yes. Uh, the Israelis, in case of a peaceful settlement with the Arab uh, governments, would then uh, be on the same footing as all other nations when it came to using the Suez Canal. You know the problem between the Arabs and the Israeli is a problem going on for 20 years. I think many people in your country don't uh, follow the reasons of uh, the continuation of this problem for a long time. He was talking now just to the audience and speaking about the war of 1948. Well, there was a war in 1948. Some people under the Israeli propaganda accuse us of beginning this war, which is not true. I saw that in many of the newspapers and the magazines in the United States. In 1948, well, there was the partition. There was the Palestinian state and the Jewish state. Before naming the Jewish state, this was decided in the United Nations. And on 15th of May, Britain decided to leave Palestine. Before the 15th of May, 1948, the Israelis attacked the Palestinian state. They occupied Yaffa, they occupied Akka, they occupied many territories of the so-called Palestinian state, which was really... Uh, said by the United Nations. Well, this was the reason of the first uh, war. The Arabs went on, of course, to secure the Palestinians and to help the Arabs in the Palestine state. What happened after that? There was the armistice uh, agreement. But also there were United Nations resolutions by that time, after the war and during the war, that the refugees the Palestinians who were expelled out of their country return back and have compensation about the damages. Israel refused to implement this resolution. Then there was a resolution for a conciliation committee and the Israelis agreed and the Arabs agreed to attend this conciliation committee. This was on 49. And we went there. The committee was formed from the United States, France and Turkey. And still the committee until now in the United uh, Nations. But after the first meeting, the Israelis refused to talk about the rehabilitation of the uh, Arabs or the return of the Palestinians. This was the reason. We were insisting about the rights of the Arabs of Palestinians according to the United Nations resolutions. The Israeli refused and that's why the problem continued for uh, 20 years years. From that time, the Suez Canal question continued also. Israel was not permitted to use the Suez Canal until they implement the United Nations resolution. They refused to implement the United Nations resolution. 
And so they were not permitted to use this uh, canal until today. So the question is connected together. Uh, how do you think that a settlement, you say that if a satisfactory settlement were reached with Israel, then they uh, could be given a normal place in the life of the Middle East, is I think what you say. Uh, how do you propose that uh, the settlement should be reached? What would you say of the Yaring mission, the mission of uh, Dr. Gunnar Yaring, the United Nations envoy? Uh, is that the way to go about it, or should, the, we, uh, should there be negotiations with Israel, or an exchange of declarations? What is your view of the way the settlement should be approached? Well, of course, in order to reach peace, we have to uh, give up, or the Israelis have to give up, expansion. If they insist about expansion, there will be no peace. From the statements of all the Israeli leaders, they speak about expansion. But Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, and parts from Sinai, and parts from the Western Bank. So, if we want, or if the world community want peace, they must feel that peace don't mean expansion to any party. Then after that, Israel was created by the United Nations. So in order to achieve peaceful uh, settlement, this must be through the United Nations. Through the United Nations? Yeah. Through the Yaring mission or through other means? Any, any means. Mm -hmm. It's the same. The Israelis, as you very well know, have repeatedly uh, said that they want to sit down face to face with the Arabs. Uh, they prefer that method of approach, or keep saying that they do. Um, what is wrong with that from the Arab point of view? I have just been in Paris, for example, where the United States is sitting down with the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. Uh, what is wrong with direct face-to-face -face negotiations? I might add that the negotiations in Paris are not proceeding very rapidly, but nevertheless they are going on. Well, of course, uh, the question uh, is different from the meetings of uh, Paris. Now there is a, a nation, country, with their armed forces occupying big part of the Arab territories, Sinai, the uh, 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 western bank of uh, Jordan, the Golan Heights uh, in Syria. So if we sit with them on a table to negotiate terms for peace, we'll be sitting on a table of capitulation will be in the strong situation and uh, well they will ask either we accept their terms they will be in a position to dictate or they will not leave uh, the occupied territories and well that's what they say today they say today either the Arabs do so so and so and so or will not uh, evacuate the occupied territories so as I said Israel was created by the United Nations. The United Nations was responsible about all these developments in this area, about all these troubles in this area. So we think better to have the peaceful settlement through the United Nations. Well, Uthant, the Secretary General of the United Nations, has just said in the past few days, as you know, that there has been no perceptible progress through the Yaring mission, and that he doesn't think that Dr. Yaring will wish to continue for another year and a half to make efforts at a settlement. Meanwhile, the big four powers are continuing to meet, at least on the level of ambassadors. They seem also not to have accomplished a great deal, but they are continuing to meet. Do you have... Uh, uh, do you, do you have any hopes from the four power meetings? Do you support their effort and encourage it? Well, we have to ask and we have to know why Uthant have said that there was no progress in Yaring mission. Hmm. Well, the Israelis uh, refused to implement the United Nations uh, resolution. Hmm. They refused to answer. They insisted only about one uh, question in their talks with Yaring, that the Arabs have to come and sit with us and after that, we are ready to say our points of view. But on the other hand, the statements of the leaders of Israel are mainly concentrating on the point of view of expansion. They want to take the Arab land and add it to the Israeli land. 
Well, about the four parts meeting, this is a step which is going now from the beginning of this month for fifth, 15 days. Well, we have to wait and see how the four parts uh, will uh, come uh, to end these talks. Are you being informed uh, regularly about the four power negotiations? Well, I'm not informed, but I know what's going on. Oh, I see. You have your means. Yes. Good. Uh, do you feel that a four power guarantee of any settlement reached with Israel would be desirable? Do you want such a guarantee or do you feel the need of such a guarantee? Well, I think uh, if there is a guarantee to the settlement, uh, we prefer to have this guarantee through the Security Council. The four powers are members in the Security Council. Uh, would you, when you say a guarantee by the United Nations, would you envision then a restoration of some kind of United Nations force in this area? Well, of course, these are uh, details. If we have United Nations uh, forces in this area, these forces have to be according to our consent and according to the Israelis' consent. Mm -hmm. And we think that these United Nations forces have to be uh, astride the uh, borders. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, if there is peace, really, if the Israelis agree to solve the two main problems, and the first main problem in the end, that is not to keep the occupied territory, and the second main uh, problem is the people, the Palestinians. If they agree to give the Palestinians their rights according to the United Nations resolution, there will be no trouble in this area. There will be peace. So there will be no, no need to the uh, international uh, forces or any other means. You alluded there indirectly to something that might be of interest, and that is, you said that the United Nations force would have to be here by the agreement of the Arabs or, and the Israelis. Um, and that they should be along the borders. I believe that this implies that you would not consider the demilitarization of the Sinai Desert, which is the largest part of Egyptian territory now occupied by the Israelis. Is that correct interpretation? We haven't said uh, anything about the demilitarization of Sinai Desert. This was said by some of the Israeli leaders or military uh, people. But uh, if we agree about the demilitarization of Sinai, well, that we will be giving the Israelis opportunity to be in Cairo uh, uh, within uh, 12 hours. Because if they move from the borders uh, through uh, open Sinai, one will not be feeling at all security. And if there is peace, why we agree about demilitarization of uh, Sinai? If the Israelis ask about the demilitarization of Sinai, this means that they don't want peace, or they don't intend peace. Can you uh, envision a situation where the United Nations might simply supervise uh, the, the borders, however, uh, and leave uh, Egypt in full occupation of its territory, that is, the Sinai Desert? Can you, can you envision a United Nations force patrolling the borders, uh, at least in the early stages of a peace settlement, in order to avoid incidents? Well, I think these are uh, details uh, to be discussed uh, to achieve the uh, peaceful solution. You know, in 1956, uh, the recommendation of the United Nations was to uh, have uh, a police force, international police force, in the Israeli side and in the Egyptian side. Mm -hmm. But there was only one condition, that's to have these uh, troops with the consent of the campaigners. We agreed, then the Israelis refused, mm -hmm. and then the uh, police force continued for ten times. But when you ask the withdrawal of the police force, well, there were protests from the Israelis that we asked the withdrawal of the police force, but they refused to say, or people forgot to remember that they refused 10 years ago, or more than 10 years ago, to have police force there. By having the police force on either sides, this will give security to everyone. If they don't consent to have the police force, there will be police force on our side. If we withdraw the police force, there will be police force on the other side of the borders. I see. The, uh, the the question comes down then to this point, it seems to me. 
What measures would you take to provide the secure borders that, uh, that is mentioned in the United Nations resolution? What measures would be, would be taken? Simply the signing of a peace treaty or the signing of a peace agreement or, the, or a declaration of peace between the powers? Or would you take any measures at all to... Well, there are many measures, but the uh, most important one is peace. Mm -hmm. If there is a solution about the territory, about the withdrawal of the Israelis from all the occupied territory, and if there is also solution uh, to the Palestinians problem and uh, implement the United Nations resolution according to their rights and their homeland, well, there will be no problems after that. There will be no uh, reasons for uh, tension. You've mentioned several times, and other spokesmen of the Arab cause have mentioned frequently, the plight of the Palestinian Arab refugees. You seem to place great stress on that. That is, the plight of the people who've been displaced from the territory that is now Israeli or Israeli-occupied. Is there, do you consider that their right to repatriation uh, or compensation is an absolute prerequisite for peace? In other words, if the Israelis would not agree to repatriate these people, allow them to return to their former homes, or to compensate them to allow them to settle elsewhere, a peace agreement would be impossible. Is that the Arab view? Well, as I told you at the beginning, why this problem has been going on for 20 years? After 48, we accepted to go to Lausanne and to attend there with the Israelis and meet through the conciliation committee in order to solve the problem of the refugees according to the United Nations resolution. The United Nations resolution said that they have to return back and be compensated to their homeland from where they were expelled during the war. Then the Israelis refused to implement that. And that's why the problem is going on for 20 years, mainly. The Israelis say, I believe, that this, they consider this an international problem and that they are prepared to make their contribution to the resettlement of refugees. Uh, would that uh, be sufficient in your view or must the uh, Palestinian Arabs have the absolute right to return to their homes if they wish to? You know, when the Israelis say that this is an international problem, that this means that they refuse to implement the United Nations resolution. And they are refusing to implement the United Nations resolutions from 48 until now. And I want to say that the uh, uh, treatment of the Palestinians and expelling them from their homeland, from Palestine, was well, the main reason I'm stressing that again for the continuation of this problem for 20 years. Mm -hmm. I feel that the people abroad don't understand why we continue without reaching peace or without reaching settlement. Many people, especially in the United States, put the blame on us really forgetting completely what happened on 48, forgetting the one million refugees who were getting expelled by the Israelis from Palestine. Well, we have here uh, one million people. United Nations said by that time, the United Nations uh, who said that there would be Israel, decided the creation of Israel, said that those refugees have to return back. The Israelis refused. So, if we don't solve the problem of the personnel, the people, the Palestinians, there will be no peace. Is it realistic to expect, however, that uh, Israel, which uh, wishes to be, and has constituted itself as primarily a predominantly a Jewish state, would accept a very large number of, of uh, Arabs back into that territory? Well, why not the Jews and the Arabs, the Christians and the Muslims, were living here in the Middle East for centuries, for thousands of years. The Jews were living here in Egypt, and they are living here in Egypt, in spite of the propaganda which uh, was used against us uh, in uh, your country, that we don't treat the Jews well. You can go all over the country and you can see the Jews. Some of them asked to leave the country, and we refused 
uh, we agreed and then they refused to leave the country and they said that they want to stay. We arrested Jews, about 80 Jews, but we arrested also after the war um, Muslims and Christians for the security of the country. The Israelis now are arresting more than 7,000 uh, Arabs from the occupied uh, territories and uh, uh, Gaza. So, I want to say again, the Jews and the Muslims, the Christians, the Arabs were living here for uh, centuries. As a matter of information, how many uh, members of the Jewish community in Egypt are left now? How many are still remaining? We have here about 5,000 uh, Jews. About 5,000? Yeah. And uh, how many, uh, you say, are under detention now? 80? About 80, yes. Some, uh, some of the, there were uh, more than that, but... Some, released. Have been, uh, some have been released. Yes. Mm. The, so I want to complete uh, my explanation. We are living together and there was no ha uh, hatred. We said that, it is well known, but some, uh, I think some people have forgotten that, uh, that we and Jews uh, are cousins. Uh, Musa was uh, born here in uh, Egypt. We were always living in uh, uh, very good conditions. So why the Muslims and Christians, the Arabs and the Jews don't live together? Let me turn to a question now, if I may, of Arab unity. I believe I am uh, correct in saying that uh, only uh, the United Arab Republic and Jordan have endorsed the uh, United Nations Resolution of 1967. Is that correct? Um, the other Arab states have not lent their support to it. Lebanon, I think. Uh, Lebanon has. Yeah. Uh, does this mean a disunity among the Arabs in their approach to the Israeli problem, or is there some other explanation of this? Uh, well, of course, it is not a question of unity or disunity. It is a question of uh, uh, points of view. Mm. Everyone has his own point of view according to such a sensitive question like this question. Uh, then uh, it seems to me that uh, it might be impossible granting the position of Syria, which has refused to enter into any kind of discussion at all on this matter, that uh, a settlement might have to be reached between one or two of the Arab states in Israel. Is that conceivable to you? Is there any objection to that from your point of view? That agreement mm -hmm. might be reached, for example, by Jordan with Israel separately, or by uh, the United Arab Republic with Israel separately? You know, if we agree about solving or settlement this question uh, between Egypt and uh, Israel alone. This means the uh, continuation of the occupation of the Arab territory in uh, Western Bank of uh, Jordan and the Golan Heights. Then when we speak about the uh, withdrawal of the Israeli armed forces from the occupied territory, we mean the occupied Egyptian and Jordanian and Syrian territory. So. Uh, if they uh, only withdraw from one country and continue on the other countries, there will be no solution or settlement. And that is but clearly not satisfactory to you. Yes, yes, of course, there must be a complete evacuation from all the Arab territories. We have often heard it said, and uh, how true it is, I don't know, I want to ask you, that no Arab leader no Arab government could actually sit down at a table and negotiate with Israel and sign an agreement. Is that uh, really the case? Well, I want to tell you something. On 1949, on uh, February, well, uh, we sat with the Israelis on a table, and there was a representative of the United Nations, Punch, and we agreed about arms, we know about the arms agreement of 49. What happened after that? The Israelis refused to implement the arms agreement and they said this agreement is dead. These are the Israeli agreements. And that's why we, and that's why we insist about the uh, United Nations uh, agreement and uh, securing any uh, settlement. I believe that I'm interpreting you correctly when I say that, uh, let me first state Israel's position in this matter and uh, let 
and I'd like to hear yours. Israel holds, I believe I'm correct in saying, that in order to establish these secure and recognized boundaries that are provided for in the United Nations resolution, that there need to be some adjustments in the borders in various places uh, in what was formerly Palestine. Um, are the Arab states, or are you personally, prepared to see any such adjustments? I'm speaking now of border adjustments, not of large uh, areas of territory. Are you prepared to agree to such adjustments or not? Well, if you remember the um, uh, Security Council uh, resolution, uh, it was said about um, secure and recognized boundaries, not for Israel, mm -hmm. but for all uh, yes. countries. Now uh, Israel is trying to give the impression that secure and recognized boundaries is uh, uh, only for Israel. So we have to reach agreement about secure and recognized boundaries in connection with the Israeli interests. But in the Security Council it was not mentioning the Israelis, it was mentioning all uh, the areas. Then uh, let me say something for you. Our borders uh, were here for years and years, centuries. So uh, how uh, anybody uh, could ask me uh, to agree to give him uh, adjustments in these uh, borders or uh, on, on, other, on other way, give him parts from our territory. Let's put the shoe on the other foot for a moment. Is there any territory you want from Israel? From our borders, we don't want any territory. Specifically, I think the, the American public would like to know is whether the Arab states could agree to the continued, continued Israeli control of East Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, I know what King Hussein has said about that. I believe you may have said the same thing, but uh, I'd like to hear it. Well, uh, I said to you at the beginning, we have to speak either about peace or expansion. Mm. By what you said, the control, I say, occupation mm. of the old city of Jerusalem, this is expansion. No Arab or uh, Muslim uh, could agree about that. Have you uh, considered what is said to be a United States proposal, I don't know that it's an official proposal, that the city of Jerusalem might remain unified uh, under Israeli administration, but that there would be a special status there for Jordan or the Arab states generally? Has any such proposition been made to you? Have you heard of such a proposal? This was in the uh, American uh, working uh, paper. It was in the American working paper, to the, to, which was uh, Submit represented to the uh, submitted to Yaring uh, uh, big uh, powers, I think, oh, yes, for the big poor powers. Uh, yes. powers. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, when we speak about unifying a city like uh, Jerusalem, uh, really unifying uh, something like that needs uh, self-determination by the people. If you unify the old city of Jerusalem with the uh, Israeli city of Jerusalem. In spite of the will of the people of old Jerusalem, this uh, will be occupation. This will be dictation, not unification. And also, well, one time uh, also somebody came in Europe and he said that he's going to unify uh, Europe. And then uh, he was occupying country after another country in order to unify. He unified uh, Austria with his country and then he unified also Czechoslovakia but we said about that by that time that this is not unification this is occupation I hope that you can remember that in the meantime now uh, if a peace settlement were reached with Israel what would happen to the Arab commando groups that are now operating against the uh, Israeli occupation forces uh, these uh, groups Al Fatah and the others, I think, have said that they would not uh, support the 1967 resolution of the United Nations. Is there, would they be disbanded? Uh, could they, uh, would they disappear? What, in your opinion, would happen to them? 
Well, first of all, we have to say something about these groups. These groups are formed from the Palestinians who were expelled out of their country by 1948. Those groups are composed of the Palestinians. Uh, those, oh, uh, uh, on 1967, the rest of their country was occupied. All what those people want is to achieve their rights, to return back to their homeland. I told you, without solving the problem of the Palestinians and giving them their rights to return back to their land and the complete withdrawal of the occupied territory, there will be no peace will be speaking about something which nobody will be able to uh, fulfill. So, if there will be peace, this means that the problem of the Palestinians will be solved. So there will be no big problem for them. You think, the, the, you think that the, these groups would dissolve automatically or naturally? You know, uh, 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 peace, if we achieve peace, real peace, as I said, peace means the land and the people. If we solve the problem of the land by the evacuation, if we solve the problem of the people by giving them all their rights according to what was said by the United Nations resolution, well, there will be real peace. Well, then we should not worry about uh, the Palestinians' commandos. Do you think uh, now, speaking of, again, of what uh, Secretary Uthan said, that there had been little discernible progress made by the United Nations. Do you think that the prospects for peace are now slipping away? You know, as long as the Israelis are insisting not to uh, implement the United Nations uh, resolution, and as long as the Israeli uh, leaders are intending to expand and add Arab territory, more Arab territory, to their country, well, everyone will be feeling that there will be no opportunities for peace, either peace or expansion. Was there a time in your memory when the peace prospects were rather better than they are now? Looking back, I had personally the idea that in 1957 the prospects for peace were rather better than they are now, and that they were better at the time of the United Nations debate in 1967 than they are now. You know, uh, we here in this country were not feeling uh, peace at all during uh, the last 20 years. And we were looking to Israel according to what they say to us. I want to tell you something. They say to us, they say here something different from what they say abroad or in the United States newspapers. Always there were threats to us by the Israelis, the Israeli leaders, the Israeli military uh, people. Well, they say about the wars, 48 war and uh, uh, 56 uh, war and uh, then 67 war. I told you about the 48 war. Well, what about the 56th war? <coughs> Who began the war? Who attacked? The Israelis got the opportunity of the nationalization of the Suez Canal and being in bad terms, I mean, we were in bad terms with the United Kingdom and France, and then there was the plot to attack Egypt by that time. And after attacking Egypt, they were also giving statements to join Sinai to uh, Israel. Well, of course, after the withdrawal of the uh, French troops and British troops and lately the Israeli troops from our territory were not also feeling uh, peace because they were always speaking about forcing a settlement. If the Israelis say that their strategy based on the idea of forcing a settlement, this means to everyone that forcing a settlement is war. Because if you fulfill something by force, this means war. This was always their strategy. We're not feeling peace here. Now, President Nasser, on that point, I'd like to ask you a question which I think is very serious for, for you, uh, for all the world, really. And that is whether failing a settlement with Israel, is there an immediate and serious threat of war in this part of the world now? 
Well, I think there is a law, international law, if your country is occupied by armed forces, by your enemy, it is not only your right to liberate your country, but it is your duty. And I think uh, you remember what happened in the Far East when you, the United States was attacked, when MacArthur returned back, he said that he will return to liberate the occupied territory. Well, it is the intention of every Arab, of every Egyptian here, to liberate our occupied territory. Well, do you have the strength now to use your own phrase, I think I'm quoting it correctly, at least in translation, to regain what belongs to you? I think that was the phrase you used. Do you feel you have the strength? Well, the question is not a question of strength. And I cannot say to the Israelis if I have now, because they will see the program, if I have now the uh, strength or if I don't have the strength. But I, say, I can say only our intentions. Well, can you say anything uh, without giving away military strength uh, secrets about uh, the strength of your armaments? Have they been fully restored to the 1960, to the 1967 uh, level? Well, I can say oh, also for, uh, only for you. Only for me. That uh, we are uh, building up our armed forces. Uh, looking at the other side, the Israeli side, what uh, are they doing, in your view, with their armed forces? Well, of course, the Israelis are building their armed forces. They received after the invasion because they invaded our country and the Arab countries on 67. They received the Skyhawks. This is, these are airplanes from the United States. And now the United States have agreed to give them uh, Phantom uh, airplanes. They received also armored cars and tanks from the uh, United Kingdom. They uh, could have the possibility to get uh, varieties of arms from everywhere. Also, they, can, uh, they are threatening us now, and they are occupying our territories. And they say everywhere that they are threatened by the Arab and go to collect uh, uh, money. They collect millions of dollars from the United States. They collect millions of dollars from other uh, countries. We don't collect uh, dollars from uh, anywhere. And by dollars, of course, they can uh, get arms. And also by these dollars, uh, they can uh, face uh, the economic uh, situation because, of course, they can have mobilization. Also, we have mobilization. So they are in better, better conditions. Let's take a still more serious question. Do you think that there is a possibility that uh, Israel might uh, develop a nuclear bomb and thus uh, radically alter the balance of power in this uh, area? Well, about this uh, question, of course, uh, if uh, they uh, develop uh, atomic uh, bombs, we also uh, could uh, develop atomic bombs. We have our technicians and uh, they can do that, but it's expensive, of course. It's very, very expensive. But if they got it, we'll get it. But I want to say something. We uh, signed the Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty, and uh, they refused to um, sign it. Of course, in this treaty, there are assurances by the United States and uh, the Soviet Union that all countries who signed this uh, treaty uh, must have uh, security against any uh, atomic threat. You would in that case uh, count on support from the Soviet Union and the United States if you were threatened with an atomic bomb. And also we have to try uh, to work in the same field that the Israelis. For several days now there's been heavy shelling between the Egyptian and Israeli positions on the opposite sides of the Suez Canal. Uh, from, the, from your point of view, from the Egyptian point of view, what is the aim and purpose of these uh, bombardments? What, what is causing all of this uh, shooting? From, from the first beginning after the occupation, uh, the Israelis were in a better uh, situation than us because uh, the Israelis were on the eastern side of the canal facing uh, two big uh, cities. Uh, with the population of about uh, uh, 
600,000. These cities are the cities of uh, Suez and Ismaili and some other small uh, cities on the western side of the uh, Suez uh, Canal. And they began from the first uh, uh, time after ceasefire, the bombardment of uh, Suez and uh, Ismaili. Of course, as a result of the continuation of the bombardment, we suffered many civil casualties because they were bombarding uh, the civilians and aiming the houses uh, of the civilians and on the other hand their aim was to affect uh, our refineries uh, there. Uh, we have decided after that to evacuate uh, uh, the bulk of the people from Suez and uh, Ismailia and keep uh, uh, only there uh, those who are needed to run the work in the two uh, cities. So, um, also, uh, we were rebuilding our army after that, after when we thought that uh, time uh, is uh, ripe uh, for counteraction from our side, we also began to uh, bombard them. This is the story in brief. Uh, it doesn't, uh, in your opinion, signify anything more serious than that at this time, simply an exchange of fire? Or... Well, we think that uh, our uh, plan was uh, based on three uh, main uh, points, uh, defensive, building up the defensive uh, situation, then turning from the face of the defense to the face of uh, retaliation, and then after the phase of retaliation, we have to enter the phase of liberation. Now we are in the second phase, the phase of retaliation. Let me turn from military affairs to politics and ask you a question about President Nixon. Since he took office, has there been any change that you have observed in the United States' attitude toward these issues in the Middle East? Is American policy, to use Governor Scranton's phrase, which has now become so familiar, is American policy more even-handed in your view? Well, of course, the first thing which uh, we feel that we are not uh, dealing with Rostow brothers. Rostow brothers, I think you know them. One of them was in the White House. The other one was in the State Department. They were representing the point of view of Israel, not the point of view of the United States. Excuse me by saying that, but this was our uh, impression. And also, you know, uh, your representative in the United Nations by that time was defending Israel more than the Israeli representative. This was uh, Goldberg. After leaving their posts, of course, they are now giving statements which uh, uh, are uh, clearly uh, let one know that they support 100% the point of view of Israel. Now, well, we don't have the Rostov brothers, we don't have uh, Goldberg, there is a new uh, administration, uh, and uh, uh, new people dealing w with the question, but just beginning. Do you think this is an appropriate time for you to reestablish uh, diplomatic relations with the United States? Well, I'll tell you something, of course, we like to have diplomatic relations uh, with the United States. But, of course, uh, in order to have these diplomatic relations with the United States, there uh, should be a, a change, of course. Uh, until now, there was no change in the policy of the United States. All what we want from the United States to be fair and to be just in dealing with this problem. We don't want the United States policy to be uh, in our side. We don't want uh, the United States policy to support us against the Israelis, but we want the United States policy to be just in dealing with the problems. We want even-handed, as it was uh, uh, said when uh, Governor uh, Scranton uh, visited us uh, uh, before January. And the answer seems to be that you are not yet convinced that uh, American policy is such that you would want to reestablish relations just now. Well, of course, the main point is the uh, occupation and the evacuation of the Israeli armed forces. Uh, of course, uh, in order to establish uh, relations, there must be a clear uh, situation by the United States. And it is a question which is affecting our internal uh, policy because we uh, will say to our people, 
we will resume the relations because of so and so. So we wait for that to happen. Do you think then that the United mm. States is in position to require the Israelis to withdraw? We hope. We hope so. Well, are you encouraged then by the, uh, by the interest that the United States is taking in the four power talks, by its willingness to participate in these talks, even though I think the Israelis are somewhat um, uh, opposed to American participation? It would seem so from their statements. Well, I want to say something. When Yering was appointed, um, it was clear uh, to everybody that he will continue for more than a year and a half, and he continued for more than one year and a half uh, without re uh, reaching any solution. Well, let us hope that the four power stock uh, don't continue for uh, two or three or four years. The uh, conciliation committee, which was appointed by the United Nations on 49, is still uh, uh, alive until now without uh, any result. Something uh, what happened in the past about the Israeli-Arab uh, problems was that committees, meetings, discussions begin, but they don't come to an end. Turning to another aspect of foreign policy, your critics, as you are well aware, say that the Soviet Union, through military and economic aid to this country, uh, now dominates the United Arab Republic and that you've given in effect, given Moscow a strategic foothold in the Mediterranean. What is your observation on that criticism? You know, this is uh, not a new criticism, if you remember what was said about us on 55, especially in the New York Times. <laughs> you know, this was said in you the New York Times. You have to refresh my memory. <laughs> in the New York Times on 55, when we uh, reached the arms deal with the Soviet Union, it was said that this will put us uh, under the domination of the Soviet Union and so on. And uh, I had interviews uh, after that with the, uh, the editors from the New York Times and said this will not happen. Then when we reached the agreement with the Soviet Union about building the high dam after the withdrawal of the offer of financing the high dam by the United States, it was said also in the newspapers, including the New York Times, <laughs> that will be under the uh, influence of the Soviet Union. We got for the high dam 5,000 uh, technicians participated with us. Now, after uh, nine years, we have finished the high dam. The Soviet technicians have returned back to their uh, countries, leaving uh, only now here about 300. They will go next year after uh, ending the, uh, uh, having the turbines in the high dam. But nothing uh, has been uh, done, that's to say, to be under the influence of the Soviets. Then, after 67, it was said so, and you say uh, that now, but uh, after 67, uh, the Soviet Union really helped us. We lost all our army. Well, uh, many countries have lost their armies uh, before. Well, uh, during the Second World War, the United States have lost their navy in Pearl Harbor completely. But they were able to study after that. We lost our army, and uh, we were in need, of course, uh, to have new arms and to rebuild our armed forces. The Soviet Union have agreed to give us. Then we asked them to give us technicians. And they agreed. We have technicians now. And we asked them about many things, to help us in the economical field, to give us raw materials, supply us with wheat. They, they agreed about that. Well, how they can influence us? This is uh, the question. And uh, about what you said uh, uh, about uh, having uh, food, strategic food uh, in the Mediterranean. Well, the Soviets are there, the Soviets were there, and the Soviets will be there. So, Soviet Union is a big power. And a big power for the first time, I suppose, in history in the Mediterranean. Well, they were very clever to be a big power in the Mediterranean, or not to have the Mediterranean only uh, for one, one country. And I want to tell you something the Israelis said that uh, they 
get assurances uh, from President Johnson that uh, the Sixth Fleet is uh, uh, ready for uh, their help uh, they need it. This was said by the leaders of uh, Israel. Well, before we end this uh, conversation, President Nasser, I think we should take advantage of what is really a rare opportunity. A rare opportunity for you, and a rare opportunity particularly for our audience. An opportunity for you to address uh, to the American people, personally and directly, any message you like. What would you like uh, to tell the American people that I haven't asked you about? Well, I think that I have to say to the American people that uh, they have to understand us, the Arabs and not to listen to the hostile uh, propaganda which is concentrated against uh, the Arabs and against us, especially in the United States. And the Israelis are very, very influential and very clever in that field. I want to say also to the United States uh, people that the Arab people uh, have great appreciation to the United States people and while the Arab people are friendly people, and they want to uh, have the opportunities for uh, good and better relations between the two peoples. There is no direct uh, conflict between the United States uh, and the Arabs. The only reason for conflict between the United States and the Arabs is uh, the Israelis and the United States taking the sides of Israel. We want the United States and United States people to be even-handed in this uh, problem. One final question, a brief one. I've asked you about your country's military strength. What about its economic strength today? Great or small? Our it's growing, country. your country, its yes. economic strength. It is growing. This year we are fulfilling growth of uh, production of 6.5%. In spite of the difficult position in which we face, we are building uh, steel mills. We are now building steel mill, a new steel mill. And the production will be one million tons in addition to our steel mills which we have. Uh, we are building a strip mill. I will open it on the 1st of May. The investment of it is 70 million pounds. So we are progressing in all fields. We are, in spite of that, going on in our plan of industrialization, all our uh, plans, and we're having opportunities of work for everyone. We don't have unemployment. We are building schools, we are going on in the development of our country, and we are going on in our plan to raise the standard of living, double the national income every 10 years. Well, as they say in Washington, thank you, Mr. President, and goodbye from Cairo. Well, not all, thank you. Educational Television and the New York Times has presented News in Perspective. Special Edition President Gamal Abdel Nasser with Clifton Daniel. <laughs>